Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of the AI Hardware Show. My name is Ian Cutteris, and joining me as always is Saywell Foxen from E-Times. Hello. In this series, we speak about AI hardware, the purposes of AI hardware, some good, some bad, some alive. Mostly some good. Dead. Mostly Mo good. Mostly good. Mostly good. AI is a force for good. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. Next question. <laughs> And so in this show, we just cover six of the hot topic button AI hardware pieces in the market, things that we've scripted. And if you enjoy this, then there's an after show podcast as well. Stay tuned for that. Now, I know a number of our audience want the hardware we're describing in these episodes to be available in things you can actually buy, have on your desk or in a system by your feet. For this one, it showcases a company that might eventually do that. Tense Torrance Grayskull is the first retail chip from the company where Jim Keller now sits as the CEO. Tense Torrance Compute philosophy is around the concept of a graph processor. A machine learning algorithm is essentially a series of graphs, so make something that computes graphs really should be the first step. Grayskull was built to do exactly that. The chip is built up of 10.6 cores, enough to have 315 teraops of 8-bit compute. Each 10.6 core contains five baby risk cores in order to use the compute engine, move memory around, and work the onboard network. A 10.6 core is optimized at around the four teraop level, which based on the modeling the company has done, seems to be the sweet spot for both training and inference. This first generation uses eight channels of LPDDR4 memory for memory bandwidth and has additional ARC cores for sideband compute. It communicates through the PCI interface if it needs to access to anything else. Today, Tense Torrent is working on the second generation wormhole, which is already buying tr being trialed by customers on a PCI card. It has a similar design, except faster GDDR6 memory and lots of ethernet. So it can be used for training. After wormhole comes black hole with additional built-in RISC-V CPUs for transformer compute and a die to die interface for chiplets. After that, there's high speed custom RISC-V coming in the future, which we'll mention in another episode. Tense Torrent is one of the few companies in this series with a multi-generation roadmap, speaking not only about evolution and optimization, but also about revolution and re-architecting the baseline. I've had several interviews with Jim Keller about this, and Sally has one coming soon, so you should check those out. I asked him about PCI cards coming to retail, and the short answer was in time. You should check the interviews to learn more. Not to be outdone by Google, hyperscaler AWS is, of course, building its own AI chips, which are widely deployed in its data centers. These chips are designed at Annapurna Labs, an Israeli startup AWS acquired in 2015. AWS has both inference and training chips with current generations, both based on the second gen Neuron Core. The Neuron Core has a scalar engine, vector engine, and tensor engine. The tensor engine is based on a stochastic array, the same concept used in the Google TPU. The new version of AWS's core also adds an engine they call GPSIMD. This engine is eight general purpose processors, which can execute C code and have direct access to other engines and memory. This engine means users can implement their own custom operators, executing them directly on the Neuron Core engines. Each second gen Neuron Core tensor engine delivers over 100 teraflops of FP16. at 6x speed up from the first gen core. AWS's training chip Tranium has two second gen cores and offers 210 FB16 teraflops. Another interesting feature is that AWS has implemented stochastic rounding in hardware. Using this different rounding method means more accuracy, so training can converge 20% faster according to AWS. Usually stochastic rounding is computationally expensive, but they've added hardware support for it. AWS also has a second gen inference chip Inferentia 2 based on the same neuron core as Tranium. It also has two cores, supports the same data types and has the same amount of memory, with the same proprietary engines, but slightly, low peak, slightly lower peak teraflops at 190 for FP16. Compared with the first gen inference chip, it's 4x higher throughput and 3x higher compute performance, partly because they've changed the external memory from 8 gig of DDR4 to 32 gig of HBM2E. AWS say the new Inferentia 2 instances offer 45% better performance per watt compared with GPU-based instances. That kind of sounds like the same chip. Sounds like the same chip. Is it the same chip? 
more to come in our podcast after this episode. Now, for me, let's speak about Calray Coolidge. Now, <laughs> Calray is a spin off of the French Energy Commission, founded in 2008, and they have three generations of AI acceleration cores. However, they seem to be using an older name for their cores a massively parallel processor array. The latest generation core launched in CES 2020 is called the MPPA3-80, or Coolidge for short. Calray advertises Coolidge as a DPU, or data processing unit, built for enabling, and I quote, multiple workloads in parallel with no bottlenecks to enable efficient data intensive applications, okay? Coolidge is a very long instruction word six issue design showcasing that users must feed it instructions that could potentially do a lot of work per instruction. Each core comes with four megabytes of L2 cache, a coprocessor to accelerate intake in 16 or FP16 workflows, and the chip features 80 of these cores for these instructions, and they're arranged into five clusters. The whole chip is built on TSMC 16 nanometer FinFET, and by and large, this seems to be built for data center inference. It has two channels of LPDDR4 with ECC, two 100 gig ethernet links, and a PCA 4x16 link for installation. There's also security in mind with an onboard true, true random number generator, various encryption and cryptography algorithm support, and deterministic modes for time predictable execution. Calray promotes the use of its DPU in storage server systems, offering machine learning compute offload, as well as more compute focused features such as virtualization support, load balancing, line rate encryption, analytics, and quality of service. The idea behind this is that being more of a general purpose design means that ultimately the Calray team believe it's important to not simply be a workload accelerator, but to have multiple uses. Calray also says that its chips are suitable for automotive use cases as well, especially as it has networking, compute, and security. A report from the Flash Memory Summit in 2022 firmly put Calray's solution as more of a storage-focused network interface accelerator rather than automotive. Then again, that was Flash Memory Summit, not Automotive Memory Summit. So bear that in mind. FlexLogix has been around for a little while. They started in 2014 as an EFPGA company. That is a company that licenses FPGA IP to go onto other people's SOCs. FlexLogix EFPGA IP has been licensed more than 40 times for applications like 5G, FinTech and Defense, and even for IoT devices. The company launched an AI accelerator chip in 2020. The Infrax X1 was designed to go up against the Nvidia Jetson Xavier at the edge and the T4 in the edge server market. The strategy was to compete with NVIDIA on both performance and price in the 7 to 13 watt TDP range. The architecture, as you might expect from an FPGA company, is configurable. It's based on a one-dimensional tensor processing unit with 64 of these on the chip. And these compute units can connect to each other, to the inputs and outputs, or to the memory using a programmable interconnect fabric, similar to what's used in the company's existing EFPGA products. It means any compute unit can connect to any other for unblocked data transfer without contention. It can be reconfigured in as little as four microseconds. The memory on chip is in layers L0 to L3 that are not caches. L0 holds the weights. Weights for the next layer of the network are in L1, so they can be loaded in quickly. L2 holds activations, the intermediate results between the layers. And L3 is a scratch pad to store configurations that may need to be reused. One of the tricks to Infrax is that when smaller network layers are fused, so they're both loaded in at the same time, the intermediate activations can be stored in soft logic or FPGA lookup tables rather than having to go out to memory. So they can be fed directly into the next compute unit ready for the next layer. Rather than sell a chip, the company has changed its strategy to now offer Infrax AI architecture as an IP product to SOC makers. So that's the Flex Logix Infrax X1. X1. Say that three times fast. Yeah, they like X's over there. <laughs> So we've all been waiting for integrated machine learning accelerators in our notebook and desktop processors. Something that's more optimized than a GPU to help accelerate potential workloads relating to camera meeting effects, presence detection, power optimizations, and security. Earlier in this series, we covered Intel's Keen Bay, set to be integrated into future Intel mobile processors. Well, in this segment, let's discuss AMD's solution. Back at CES this year, AMD unveiled a new range of laptop processors, from the lower power parts all the way up to the high-powered pseudo-desktop silicon. 
In the middle of that, AMD introduced a new range of 70 40 mobile processors. That's 70 indicating generation and 40 for the Zen 4 cores. And there's also some of the latest RDNA 3 graphics. But on board are some of AMD's Xilinx based AI engines. This hardware is all built on TSMC's 4 nanometer process node. The AI engines, or at least we think, are derived from AMD's acquisition of Xilinx that completed in early 2022. Officially, they're being given the XDNA architecture moniker, with the X either being a letter to indicate anything or to indicate Xilinx. It's probably Xilinx. The exact architecture underneath is somewhat of an unknown. We assume it's similar to the AI engines that are found inside the Xilinx Versal silicon, or it could be something completely different. What makes this more confusing is that the AI engines will only be enabled on certain CPU models. With certain OEM customers, then that means that anyone wanting to use them will have to work with whichever specific, specific OEMs that AMD partners with. That could mean Dell or HP, for example. What we suspect here is that either A, a specific customer had a specific request when it came to a specific use case for these AI engines, or B, this is a very limited trial run for AMD before extending it throughout the portfolio. Aside from very few details on the architecture, there was no indication of framework support performance, or software development kits. This means the usefulness of the hardware, or at least this generation, is going to be very limited to those specific key partners that wanted it. Based in notebooks, I can see that being used for presence detection, i.e. being able to determine if someone is in front of the notebook or not to save power, or to detect if someone is looking over your shoulder. Those might be important use cases here. Despite every company under the sun claiming their solution is ideal for automotive, Umbrella's CV3 family is actually designed to be an automotive domain controller with AI acceleration. Perception in autonomous vehicles is moving from processing next to the sensor at the very edge towards domain controllers where more centralised processing can enable sensor fusion from different types of sensors. Umbrella's CV3 chips are vehicle domain controllers with built-in AI accelerator IP called CV Flow. You can use it to process up to 20 streams of camera data at once or have a mix of sensor modalities like LiDAR or radar. CV Flow is tailored for computer vision, including perception, multi-sensor fusion, and path planning in level two plus to level four vehicles. Umbrella says this part can replace a 500 tops GPU, so it's pretty powerful. The latest generation is a third generation of CV Flow. It's now a combination of a neural vector processor, NVP, um, for AI workloads, and a general vector processor, GVP, with floating point support. The newest general vector processor is used for things like radar processing, and then it might hand off to the neural vector processor for actual perception. Splitting workloads between the NVP and the new GVP allows the NVP to be further optimized for convolution and matrix processing for AI. The new version of the NVP also supports graph networks and transformers. Both blocks are in-house developed IP. This is a 50 watt chip, which offers 4x the performance per watt of the previous generation, in part down to the transition to new five nanometer process technology. Yes, Amberell is one of those companies that I sometimes hear about, but I've never looked into completely. So they do many vision, vision yeah, processors and they do security one. camera processors and stuff like that. Which well. is ripe for AI acceleration. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. A yes, lot so. of these companies that we talk about, they're all doing that sort of thing. <laughs> There's a lot of vision, yeah, yeah for sure. There's a lot of vision. So if you guys love this, then give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to like and subscribe as always. And if you're watching this as we post it, then tomorrow there'll be a more general purpose podcast, general purpose, maybe we should call it GP podcast. <laughs> more free form about this hardware uh, where we get to essentially say more of what we think rather than say the scripted what we've got now. But uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Sally. See you next time. And see you in the next one.